Hello, and welcome to Very Good Video Games. I'm Scott, not Levi. Levi is not with us today because he went on a little vacation, and we thought, hey, we'll get our buddy Darren to fill in, and now it's myself, Dylan, and our guest, Darren. Yo, what's up? It's DB. Welcome, Darren, our fourth unofficial member. Yes, he's he's our fourth member. Darren has the honor of being our first guest on the show, and hopefully he won't make us regretting having him on. I played the game. I actually played the game. I did he my did. research. I'm ready <laughs> for this. Now, which game? Well, it's already in the title, as you know, but today we'll be covering the widely loved game based on the critically acclaimed Skyrim mod, The Forgotten City. The mod was originally released back in 2015, and the small team at The Modern Storyteller reimagined the game for a full release in 2021, improving on their work to create the modern masterpiece for PC and consoles. We will be going to full spoiler territory, so if you're thinking of playing this game, get the heck out of here. You can come back after you've enjoyed it. So actually, the funny thing about the spoiler warning that we usually have is that this game starts with a spoiler warning right at the beginning of the game, which I love because I uh, don't like spoilers, which I probably shouldn't tell the Internet. (laughs) It felt like we addressed us specifically because we are now content creators. We are now content creators, which I uh, yeah, I guess so. The worst label for a job ever, not artist, not video essayist, not podcaster content creator we just make just yeah. stuff as broad as possible as generic <laughs> yeah just just fluff so i guess the first thing that um we should try to talk about in my opinion is just sort of the actual game itself like i want to and i'm sure you guys want to as well dive deep right into the narrative and the philosophy right away but i just want to talk about the game mechanics what were some of the things you loved or didn't love? How do we feel about the audio and the visuals? Dylan, do you want to show Darren how it's done or? Sure, I'll begin. Um, in terms of actually, audio. Actually, okay. sorry. Okay. Actually, firstly, what background did you choose? What background did I choose? So I have actually played through this game twice now. I played through it about six months ago and I chose the archaeologist. So I figured I'm going into ancient Rome it's better if my character knows ancient Roman history stuff, which I actually know a lot of too. So a lot of it was like, oh yeah, I knew that. I knew that. But it's good that my character knows it too. Um, That was interesting doing it the first time as the archaeologist because it did give you a lot of extra information and a lot more context because there are outright, there's outright information that you can't access as the other characters without the archaeologist being able to read spoiler language. We'll get into it later. But this time I chose the military guy so I could have a gun. And that led to some great interactions in the game. I highly recommend that as a playthrough, actually. I, um, yeah, after I finished my first run in the game, I just thought, you know what? I'm going to do a really quick run just to get a couple achievements really quick. So I, I grabbed the gun on my second run. And yeah, I think we both did the same thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I- listen, we warned people that we... Uh, that we're going to spoil spoil things. We're going to spoil things right away. We shot the guy. We shot the guy right in the face. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was hilarious. He was like, nice. like, you think you can do something with that puny thing? It's like, it's like a mini ballista, and you shoot him in the head. But <laughs> So good. Yeah, well, it's, it's great. <laughs> nice. I also chose the archaeologist because the game said it rewarded thoughtful contemplation, which, honestly... It does. But to get back to the graphics conversation and the gameplay, obviously this game was the product of what was originally a Skyrim mod. So I think that it takes a lot of the like basic game mechanics from Skyrim. And in that sense, it's a little janky compared to other games. Mm-hmm. The the Skyrim link is so apparent when some people would just walk between mine and someone's conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, like I would just be talking to someone and all of a sudden someone just juts into the like just kind of trying to walk by, but they're just staring at me. <laughs> I, I'm honestly shocked a uh, dragon didn't just swoop down at some random point in the conversation that was just like some old glitch in the system. 
Wait, you're saying you didn't <laughs> yeah. get that ending? Unfortunately not. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, doing. it's very stiff the way that you kind of move around and stuff. It feels very awkward, and you can tell that the point of the game is the plot and the philosophy and the choices that you make in dialogue. The whole like way that you um, navigate around the dialogue is very Skyrim-y. Like you'll, there's stock conversations that the characters have, and then you have uh, you know a set of responses that you choose to them. And I think the game really wants you to look past the game mechanics and think and uh, think about your decisions and and how it affects everything. And I think it has just enough put into its game mechanics that like you know you can get where you want. <laughs> But, like, the, they put more time, it seems to me, into improving the graphics. It doesn't look visually as terrible as an old, you know, as Skyrim. Yeah, I thought the graphics thought were pretty good. There weren't anything amazing, but considering the team size was quite small, it's actually just a three-person team, not including voice actors and legal extra stuff. Like, the actual core team was just three guys. Yeah. So, pretty, pretty impressive. The, the music worked well for the atmosphere and the sound design was good, I thought. I thought that the music, especially for all the different areas, was really good and really interesting, really set the tone. I think also the voice acting was generally better than, say, something like Skyrim. Like there was no like just badly delivered lines. Yeah, I agree. The voice acting was top notch. I thought um, some of the some of the facial animations I thought were kind of funny. I felt like they almost had a couple stock animations for speaking to people that they all used, where they all sort of had a slight look to them that all kind of like it was like they all had the same look or something. Mm-hmm. You do is that does that make sense? Yeah, I felt the same way, and I also felt that the animations were definitely the weakest part of the graphics. Otherwise, graphically, I think it looks really solid, especially the art direction. Yeah. The other thing in terms of sound that I really didn't like was all the, the sort of sound mixing when there was different conversations going around you. Um, so just to sort of contextualize the game a little bit, because I don't think we discussed it, the game yeah. is mostly set in a time loop when you go to this ancient Roman city hidden underground. And... As the game loops, the characters will go to the same location at different points in the loop. And eventually, a lot of characters wind up in this sort of bar area. When I had conversations with characters in that bar and then other characters started talking, it was like, what is everyone saying? You guys shut up. Like, can you talk? Like, you want to turn around and tell them to shut up because you're having a conversation. One major thing about the game mechanics that I wanted to ask you guys about was this game is very focused around being a mystery and that you're the one solving things. But I don't know if I felt the joy of solving anything. I never really felt like I got the chance to feel stumped because as you guys know, there's this in-game hint system with the golden statues whispering to you. And this is not an optional thing. In fact, when I first was hearing them in scenes, I thought they were trying to lead me astray and screw with me because uh, as I found out, Leap of Faith was absolutely the way to get into uh, the villa um, like from the cliff. I don't know if you guys heard that one, but like, there's also the one where the thief shows up and the girl is going to go hide in the, in the building that falls apart. And you hear a little whisper that she shouldn't go in there. And the thing is, I, I didn't really feel like I got to solve anything. I enjoyed it, but I'm just saying I didn't feel like I had to solve much. I don't go ahead, Darren. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, There were a lot of hints everywhere, but I felt like, uh, I don't know, you you had to think about them at least. It it wasn't like there there were super clear indicators. But that being said, yeah, you usually if you like listen to the voice or there was an I think there's like a note posted on that temple that crumbles that you're talking about. <laughs> it says yeah. like attention temple might crumble at any moment <laughs> <laughs> and she's walking in there and it's like, don't let her go in there. Yeah, it's pretty clear that you shouldn't let her. Go I didn't in there. read that. I didn't read that note before I, I met this woman, though. Oh. I read the note and I went into that temple and it collapsed on me. I, died. <laughs> <laughs> I did not oh, trust God. the note. 
<laughs> um, it's really interesting because so I didn't remember the hint system being a factor in the first playthrough of the game, but in my second playthrough, I explicitly tried to tell her, like, don't go in there on my first loop. And she still goes in there because you can't actually give a good explanation for why she shouldn't go in there. So it's going to happen anyways, is what I found. Oh, that's so. A little oh, no, I, I was able to prevent her from going in there. It depends on the explanation that you give. But did There's you like- did you prevent her going in there after you had experienced the temple collapse on you? No. No. Okay. Yeah, huh. it had to collapse first. Um, okay, basically for me what happened was I chose the wrong dialogue thing and then she just went in there anyways and it collapsed on her. Mm-hmm. Then I was like, I wonder if it collapses every time or whatever, and I was investigating by myself and then I went in there and it collapsed on me. And then the third time around, I was able to uh, choose the right dialogue. So that's what I mean, like, I, I felt like I still had to investigate it, even though I knew like something was going on with the temple. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't don't get me wrong. But like there are some things where there's some. There are there are different options for solving certain things. I know that there's a secret cave entrance to get one of the plaques that is either attained that way or you can get the key from I believe his name was Rufius. So the, there's two there's there's multiple ways to get certain things done in it. I agree. There's some stuff, but it's it didn't feel like I was solving a mystery. It felt like it was kind of handed to me, like the main like the main mystery. Mm-hmm. It is very linear. Um, that's why I do think it's fair to characterize it as a bit more of a walking simulator than a puzzle game because it becomes basically inevitable that you figure out what to do, and the game is. Sorry, I think I think walking simulator is maybe just a little simplistic. It's it's it, it's a narrative game. That's what it is, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I, I think it's I think the reason why the term is a little bit justified, though, is because like in a mystery game, the fail state is essentially not a game over screen. It's getting stuck and having to try different solutions to puzzles and the problem is that there's not really a way to try out different ideas for the most part in the game. You mm-hmm. have, I think, a fairly limited range of interactions. And that's what kind of limits it as a... It's, I think, a great game, but it's not necessarily a great mystery-solving game. Even though I think the mystery itself is actually kind of good. I think the way the plot is written is better than the mechanical way that you actually end up solving it i I, like it like we just said the game the game is just a means for experiencing the story yeah Mm. that's totally right that's that's basically what it is i think there's just enough of trying to figure it out to keep you sort of like amused that way it's not super hard like you're saying though scott but it's basically just like uh the whole game is a vessel to give you the story Mm -hmm. yeah it is okay. in a similar way, as long as we're touching on mechanics, similar to how the combat of the game is just sort of barely there enough to give you some interactivity. With you're talking about with the golden bow? With the golden bow, yeah. Or the, combat the gun. Is very good, barely there. I, I did like the use of the golden bow. Mm-hmm. Actually, one thing uh, that we're maybe skipping over, but I will mention is the game has a little bit of a horror aspect. In the first couple seconds, when you start noticing the statues turning at you, it's kind of spooky. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the, just oh, the, yeah. the quiet whispering, which I know. Dar- so Darren is really this was really funny for me because I was just chilling in the living room and Darren pops out. He's like, oh, the statues are whispering in Latin and I understand <laughs> them. <laughs> yeah that was incredible okay so when you first enter the hallway to the roman city at the beginning of the game you hear a voice say Kur hik esna? and i was like oh my god that means why are you here because <laughs> i know latin very simple latin which that is and i love that and then i thought it was really cool that it gives you that one and then it gives you potesna mi audira which means can you hear me um and i was like yes i can and i can understand you <laughs> but then it gives you the english whispering afterwards and so it kind of gives you that introduction to the city where like 
you hear this strange ancient language, which most people unlike me won't understand. And then, uh, then it gives you the English. So it's like, oh, there's some kind of mysterious translation, magical translation happening here. And I, I really like that way of introducing you to the, to the city. Yeah, that is cool. Mm-hmm. The whole introductory sequence is great, especially seeing if you've replayed it, seeing all the a lot of the characters that you know from the game being frozen in gold and sort of fleeing the set. Oh, like you can I see characters even, that you met. I didn't even think to look for that when I did my second little mini run. Um, my speed run, if you will. So the narrative aspect of the game is really, that's the main aspect, I would say. There's um, there's a few mysteries or questions kind of brought up throughout the game that we slowly figure out throughout. But the main mystery that hooks us into the narrative is who breaks the golden rule and how do we stop them? That's sort of like the main catalyst, I find. And as we all know, it's the goose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did anybody, talk to the the did, did any no did anybody talk to the goose in the game i didn't i didn't know there was a goose in the game i found the there's eggs the goose? on galerius's farm there's a goose and you can talk to it and so <laughs> but you can't talk to the goat so obviously i was like well the goose must be the breaker of the golden rule which is funny that you're playing untitled goose game right now darren because you understand now <laughs> why the go- geese are so evil oh i understand just from being a regular Canadian citizen, how evil geese are. <laughs> yeah, one thing that I love about this game, which I think is what they intended for you to really love, was its focus on philosophy. Um, I think it's really cool. Like it ha- It's, it's kind of introductory. I do want to do the philosophy stuff, but I want to focus on narrative and mystery right now. Yep. Uh, okay. It's just, yeah, okay. The different okay. sins and how you break the golden rule. Um, which is what you're directly trying to investigate though it makes you come up against what is a sin what even counts as a sin because some Mm. people are like oh being gay is a sin maybe the gay character's existence itself is gonna break the golden rule somehow and then but you're like uh but no one's gold statues yet so maybe (laughs) this person is just a bigot (laughs) Mm -hmm. and well yeah, I don't think, uh, just, yeah, Ob- obviously being gay is not a sin in this day and age, but it's it's funny looking back throughout history because people thought it was. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, I know. In fact, actually, the, one of the first conversations you have with Sentius, who, yes. by the way, l- l- listen, we're going into the narrative. We're talking about the spoilers. I fucking clocked Sentius right away. because mm-hmm. I was like, the he, game- He's sus. Oh, like, as soon as you enter, it's like, what's with this guy it's like there's no way like it was mostly just me being like this guy seems too smart he's not gonna break the like he's he's gonna break the golden rule but like unintentionally but like that's what i thought but of course he turns out to be just a total dick and has trapped his daughter in a cistern so bit of bit of context yeah first thing you do when getting through the time portal um, from the present day is you meet um, Roman Mr. Clean, Galerius. Oh, come on. I was going to say, yeah, don't do Galerius like that. He's yeah. so nice. He, he's a great guy. <laughs> um, been through a lot, but he's making his way uh, through the world with his cabbage farm. I do love that you can hand off everything to him when you go through a time loop. Yeah, just absolute he's just champ. So like, he's just like, all right, I got it. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's like, whatever you want, man. You can explain it later. I'll do whatever you want. I just met you. I trust you immediately. <laughs> Any chores that you do like later in the game, you can tell him to do when you loop back and he'll just do it. And everyone loves him basically yeah. because he's the best. But Galerius then takes you to Sentius, who explains the deal with the world, which is that there is the golden rule, which is that if anyone sins, everyone else will be punished. And the way they're going to be punished is they're going to be turned to gold statues via other gold statues coming to life and shooting them with arrows that turn them to gold. And then when you confront Sentius and ask, you know, okay, how do we stop this? Like, how do we prevent sinning? You then ask the basic questions like, isn't Roman society, which he has to enforce, his logic about this 
is that in order to uphold the golden rule, we have to be the best possible version of Roman society that we can ever enforce. Like, because no one can um, commit a sin. And then immediately you go, wait, isn't the basic mechanics of Roman society inherently bad? Like all the slavery and the fact that women can't vote or have much authority, et cetera, et cetera. And then as you raise a bunch of issues with this, he then has very clear counters to all your arguments. Like slavery is, well, these people would be dead without us because they're war captives and we give them a place in society, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of the conversation as you're going through, especially how he says, well, we treat everyone equally regardless of race or sexual orientation. And that triggers the Romans didn't talk in those words. He's had this type of conversation before with someone modern. And that's when the clue oh, wow. kind of kicks in for me. It's like he knows a lot more than he's giving on in this conversation. Yeah, I just thought he was self-righteous. <laughs> he just oh, had that He just had that air of just like you 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 think you that you know best for some oh, reason. The vibes are for sure off, but there's clear yeah. evidence that no Roman would ever talk like that. Well, my brain immediately was just like, you know, that there's this is like a little bit of a mystery meta thing where it's just sort of like it, it's like classic Scooby Doo. It was the guy that brought the the mystery gang mm -hmm. to the haunted house that is obviously the monster, or it's like his mom or whatever. But so I was just like okay i i hope they actually make this something like because obviously the whole thing is that you're trying to solve the who's gonna break the golden rule which i think i think if you don't show up it would be maliolus mm -hmm. yeah yeah or actually i don't know if it would be maliolus or the assassin yeah it's interesting because there's a few things where if you start to think about it outside of the and sort of factor in the mechanics of the game, it gets weird because the assassin is triggered by you walking past a certain point. And Let's he does just assume he walks out of some point. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. It's one of those weird things. So the other thing, again, skipping ahead with spoilers, Sentius actually remembers each loop and is essentially yeah. using the time loop to live forever, which becomes very funny with the game mechanics because in the day he keeps reliving forever, he's just standing there in one place and going this election. It's the <laughs> most miserable way to spend this time loop possible. That sounds like purgatory. That doesn't yeah, sound fun at all. It's not fun at all. Like, you can see his reasoning for it if he were a realistic person, but the fact that he's a Siren character, essentially, means that his actual interactions with the world are so limited. He doesn't even eat. He doesn't talk to anyone but you, unless yeah. you go to the election. It's a completely miserable existence that he chooses to live through. Just yeah. imagine this guy standing there for all time, just in one spot. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, hmm, what shall I do today? This day number like 1058 that I've had the same day of. Maybe I will walk down the stairs and wait over here instead. <laughs> He's not even taking advantage of it like Bill Murray does in Groundhog Day, you know? Like, come on, man. <laughs> I, I would love a remake where he actually does a bunch of weird shit. <laughs> yes. It's like, how many of these girls can I win over it? <laughs> and figure on the out same day. On the same, on the day. same day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess the other major mystery that is kind of brought up is what is the Forgotten City? Because you obviously, as you're talking to people, everyone keeps mentioning the river. And of course, all of us are huge nerds. So we're all like, oh, they're talking about River Styx. Oh, like, yeah, river. right away. I clocked that. It was, I was like, it was, uh... I think it was the second person that I talked to. And then it was just like, wait, me and Al were on the fucking river. <laughs> it's embarrassing i actually did not figure it out before i had to explicitly explain to me who karen at the river is no oh, way okay yeah. so the karen okay first off the karen karen perfection thing was so fucking funny can i just yeah, say that, was, that was so clever and so funny people have a bad reaction to my name <laughs> yeah and i love one of the dialogue 
options was like, oh, is it because of the memes? <laughs> She's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go with that. So good. I thought that was br- brilliantly done. Mm-hmm. The underworld is loosely based off of the Greek and Roman understanding of the underworld, which is kind of bizarre. So it still brings questions to light that is like kind of odd. And one thing that is fun about it being the real underworld is that obviously you walk around and you notice a golden statue pushing a boulder who's obviously supposed to be Sisyphus. Mm -hmm. And there's... Who are the other ones that are down there? There's uh, Tantalus uh, reaching for the grapes in the pool by Glare's yes, house. Yes, right. I for I, I, I'm not as familiar with that one, so I didn't clue into that. Yeah. But yeah, there's uh, yeah, that was the one I caught myself. There was also Ichthion, who's tied to a golden wheel, and you find that in the sort of cliffside. And right. there's one this guy with the who has to like pan through water with the sieve. I didn't catch that statue, but I know it's in there somewhere. Oh, okay. Um, the other reference, actually, that's really funny is that you, we all met the philosopher in the cave, obviously. Yeah. Now, they don't tell you his name, but it's Diogenes, right? I mean, he does actually say his name is Philip in the end. That's, no, he gives himself the name Philip. Everyone, a lot of people change their oh, names. Yeah. But mm-hmm. he's called the Hermit Philosopher, which Diogenes was uh, referred to as. And also, mm-hmm. there's the big old there's pot. A wine barrel. Yeah. yeah uh, the, the wine barrel with him as well. When, he sleeps you, when you click on it, it says a questionable home or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. it would be Diogenes. He's also I mean, sort it, of it, like. It's, implied. it's at least implied that it's Diogenes, which mm-hmm. I thought was a really fun thing. Yeah. He's I I liked I liked the the philosopher, but I guess we should leave uh, more of talking about that until we talk about philosophy. We, we'll, yeah. we'll talk to the we'll we'll get into the depths of philosophy in a sec here. But the other uh, one of the other things, um, obviously the missing people, the Centilla captured by her own father, um, Kabash the Egyptian. Oh right, that's a major thing. Kabash is down in the Egyptian city below the current city, which mm-hmm. the Egyptian city is actually on top of the Sumerian city that was the forgotten city. So there's this really interesting link of having the Sumerian to Egyptian to Greek to Roman mm-hmm. um, history for the forgotten city where they it's, it's kind of talking about how the myths and legends and religions kind of evolve from these simple early ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that... but what we really discovered is the big biggest spoiler of them all about this game is that ancient aliens are the reason for all religions, baby. Yep. It was yep. all ancient aliens, it man. Was fucking and... chariots of the gods the entire time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the ancient aliens. Okay, yes, yeah. but yeah, ancient aliens is correct. Um, it's really interesting because he said that. They taught the early humans agriculture and basic stuff in the Middle East. And I'm like, okay, so I guess the Aztecs just also just happened to figure it out later on. The or Aztecs something. were the ones that, fig- yeah, they're actually like the ones that yeah. are clever. At yeah, yeah. <laughs> Aztecs and Chinese, it was the um, Middle Eastern and Europeans that were the dumbasses that need aliens to teach them how to do stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I guess we can talk about, like, the fact that if you collect all of the the four plaques from the Sumerian, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman eras of the Forgotten City and open the temple on the hill, you manage to get into this one final room that is glowing white, and you're like, what is this place? And you realize that you're on a goddamn spaceship over Earth. Mm -hmm. And... Basically, we'll, we'll refer to him as Pluto just for simplicity's sake. But you could call him Hades, or um, or a huge dick, <laughs> or a huge dick. Basically, the god of the underworld mm-hmm. is who he is claiming to be. Right? Yep. Yeah. So, how do we feel about that ending of seeing these aliens being the ones that have created this underworld? I would say I actually don't 
like the twist. Uh, I mean, I don't like that it's alien. I think it's specific. a fun twist. I think it's a fun twist. Yeah, yeah I thought it was a tremendous amount of fun. <laughs> it was fun, but for me, I guess, um, as I know a little bit about Roman and Greek mythology, and the way they thought about it was uh, thought about the gods was actually less literal than a lot of their myths demonstrate. Um, they actually, if you look into like philosophy on how they thought about the gods, they were almost more like forces or something or much more primal. And that's why they also thought, oh, like the Greek, like the Norse, we encounter these Norse people and they have their own gods and they have this one wise messenger god they call Odin, but that's just Mercury in a different form. Like they thought the gods took different forms to different cultures because they were ultimately more primal, unknowable aspects. I almost would have liked that better as a twist where it was a lot more almost abstract in a way. I don't know. I I just imagine there's a more intriguing twist then it turns out it was just space guys it it is kind of halfway between your point though dylan because there is one constant that is the lord of the underworld but he's either called nurgle osiris hades or pluto right so it's kind <laughs> of touching on that concept but it's doing it with the ancient alien idea which is like i said it it's fun, but I kind of see why it's causing you a little bit of like, I wish it was something else because it doesn't feel like it fits the tone of the game. Mm -hmm. it, it was very uh, off tone. You're just like, what? Aliens? It's, it's really? kind of a goofy way to end it. And then the other thing is that the fact that they're aliens, do, you could very easily rewrite it so they're not and not change anything substantive. They say still there's like an equivalent to Jupiter and Diana and Apollo anyways. And the reasoning for it is still a pantheon of gods. And yeah. it ultimately doesn't make much of a difference that they're from space. The thing is, these extreme forces of gods could be from space. And anyway, I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I, I agree. It's not the best ending, but it, I thought it was a fun ending. Mm -hmm. It was fun, too. But I, I like how you uh, eventually discover that it's aliens because like the first time that I beat the game, and I think for most people it probably would be this, it seems pretty natural, is uh, when you kill, uh, what's his name, Sent Sentius, because he tells you basically mm -hmm. when he explains how paradoxes work, he's like, yeah, so if I died, you know. No one then, could open uh, the portal. No one could open the portal, which would create a paradox, because how could you even be here back in time if no one opened the portal that you had to get into to get here back in time? That'd be a paradox. So you'd go back to the your original timeline and we'd have none of this nonsense. And you're like, I was like, oh, OK, great. You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Immediate conclusion. And then yeah, I love yeah. how the game is just like tries so hard to just like rub it in your face how horrible of a person you are for making that decision like oh my god why have you done this everyone in the city that you've loved is now dead you don't care about any of our plot lines like all the work we put they're like yeah you beat the game technically but you're an asshole and you need to do better <laughs> and then it gives you a little it gives you the little like um uh like they have a little display thing for like the numbers of different endings that you got. It's like, and you only got the first ending. There's all these other endings you could get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, yeah, you got the, I think everyone would agree is the bad ending. Yeah. I, people tend to have a bad and good ending in games. And that one is bad because you actually, it, it doesn't even serve yourself because you end up screwing yourself over as well as Al. Mm -hmm. You guys get stuck in the forgotten city anyway. Although it <laughs> yeah. is two things. One, it's very funny when you explain your reasoning to Al and he chastises you, well, you killed everyone and us, so what the fuck? And you're, you can just say, like, no regrets. <laughs> yeah. That's how you end the game. <laughs> no regrets. Hilarious. No regrets. Um, the second thing about the bad ending is that if you want to speed run the first ending, 
it's even worse because as soon as you exit the portal, you have to play soldier. You just shoot Galerius in the head, grab his zipline, and use that to swing down. You shot Galerius? No, no. I didn't do it, but that's how you speed run that first ending. Oh. You have to shoot you. him and take his zipline to get oh, closer wow. to Sentius and shoot him in the head. I yeah, I went and shot Incredible. I went and shot Sentius in the head, which was hilarious. I just had to do it for the lulls. Yeah. Um just to get the bad ending as well. Uh so mm-hmm. that the second ending, Darren, you got the second ending, I believe, first try on your first attempt or whatever, right? Yeah, I got it on my first attempt. The so yeah, the, fr- the the second ending is where you find Centilla, you free her, and then you guys peace out and escape the Forgotten City. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you escape, and then when you get back, uh, Al, um, you talk to Al, and you're like, "Yo, there's this way to escape the city. We can just get out through the cistern." And so, yeah, you 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 are able to escape after mm-hmm. all. So it's not like the first ending. You get out of that place to get back into the the real world, but there's a little bad taste in your mouth because you're like, "Ooh, I left a lot of pretty cool people back there, and they just they were turned into gold statues." And um, are they? Do they become immortal, trapped in a gold statue for all time? It kind of seems like uh, we didn't even talk about how there was some crazy lady trying to dig everyone out of the gold yep. statues. Like that was oh Navia, the the horny doctor. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, but st- <laughs> sticking with the endings, though, uh, yeah. the third ending is the one that I got on my first uh, on my first try. I knew I knew that the plaques. I just it had the sense of the plaques being like the the canon ending, and mm-hmm. so I didn't do it right away. So the third ending is the one that I did, where you save most of the people through the cistern. Hmm. And all you have to do for that is loop back after learning about um, Centilla in the dungeon and so just tell Galerius to, yeah. to gather everyone. I th- I don't think it's just that. You also have to make sure to have... You, you have to have Galerius save everyone or first? It's, I can't remember. It's been a while since I actually got this ending, so yeah. I don't But yeah, no, remember. that was the first one that I did and I was just like, all right, that was that was that was good. Obviously, we're going to go, but you know, it's weird that that game actually says there's four endings. I feel like there's five if they're going to split hairs over the second and third one because mm-hmm. I did this other ending that would be considered the fourth ending, but it's a very different ending than if you talk to Pluto. There's an ending where you confront Pluto and intimidate him to let everyone go because mm-hmm. you kill Proserp- what sorry. Persep- because you kill Proserpina. Proserpina. Proserpina is, Blech. I think, the Roman pronunciation. It's Proserpina. It's Proserpina. I was just like, ugh, there's just, you know, fucking too many fake names in my head. You're also um, getting infused with Persephone's Yeah, company. that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, there's there's the ending where you confront Pluto with Proserpina's crown, saying that you killed her, and I can do this all day. Very Doctor Strange versus Dormammu kind of deal, where, mm-hmm. where he's just, he realizes like, well, you've you've bested me, mortal, and uh, he's angry about it, but he frees everyone. So that that would be to me the fourth ending. Whereas there's the fifth and ultimate ending where you have a Socratic discourse with Pluto. And you end up making that motherfucker see the wrongs of his ways. Mm-hmm. It is very yeah, interesting. Incredible. Yeah. I love it. It's just so funny thinking this like ancient being is just like incapable of seeing the flaw in his logic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which felt, which is the part that is kind of funny about the ancient alien thing where it's just like, you're so smart and wise, but you can't see how, like, you know, illogical you're being right now. I'm go- I'm gonna go back a little bit and set up the wager. So, the backstory is the aliens came to Earth and posed as the equivalents of, well, the Sumerian gods, but then he gives the names as the Roman gods. And what they realized is that as they were giving all the tools to the Sumerians, they were just going out and waging a bunch of wars and doing a bunch of atrocities in the gods' names. So all of the gods gave up on humanity and were going to leave, except for Proserpina, 
who made herself mortal and tried to help the humans be better. When she did that, Hades then froze her in stasis. And then what happened was uh, their leader, who is Jupiter, essentially, said, well, now Proserpa can't come back because she's a human. We don't accept humans. And Hades was like, no, um, what we'll do is we'll do a wager. If a group of humans can go without sin for a single year, then and they're selected at random by giving them these weird silver coins or the o- silver ovals, yeah. then when they die with, they'll go to the Forgotten City. If they can live without sin for one year, then you're going to, I guess, turn a serpent back. I forget what exactly the end of the wager would be. Um, would be... I'll make all the humans immortal, and then they can come back to the home planet of these aliens. Including Elysium. The right. Anyways, so they make the wager, and it goes on for thousands of years until only two coins are left, which is you and Al's. And then Proserpina starts to intervene by creating the time loop ability that certain people can use. Um, I forget. So I was explaining why the wager happened. And so the logical trap that you get him in is you actually try and convince him that, look, your version of a sin, which is essentially the literal golden rule that we know in our world, which is treat others that you would want to be treated. You actually try and convince him that that is being violated, and then he says either, well, in all the cases you bring up, the person doing that is doing what they would expect others to treat them as. So, for example, there's a scam by the bartender and uh, Maliolus that basically traps people in debt bondage. And you say, well, this isn't good, and Hades goes, well, they would expect the same thing to be done to them, and they think that's fair, so it follows the golden rule and like you give him all the counter examples. And if you really press him, he says, well, if this is violating the golden rule, then I have to turn everyone to gold. Now, do you want that? And so you can't actually get him through that way. What you essentially have to do to convince him is you have to show him that the fundamental premise that doing this will make people better or can prove that they're actually capable of not sinning is fundamentally flawed. And in fact, putting them in this situation is making people worse. So he gives, ex- you give him the example of like uh, Rufius harassing Virgil because Rufius is just getting so paranoid and he also has like arthritis essentially. Rheumatism. Rheumatism. I think it's, yeah, it's the same thing as arthritis. Is that the, old, is that the old term yeah. for arthritis? It's okay. the old term for arthritis. Um, and you give a bunch of examples where people are actually acting worse because of the golden rule set up. And that's how you begin to turn him. And then it ends with you showing him that he's not entirely above humans, even though he thinks like, well, you don't treat insects like equals. Why should we treat you like equals? And I forget the exact line of reasoning that you use. You Okay, so... Yeah. You, you're the 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 wording is different with each iteration but he talks about the roman i think it's the stoic saying treat your inferiors as you would want your superiors to treat you yes that's it and so and so then you basically you slowly corner him into admitting that jupiter is his superior and that jupiter has put you into a losing wager so that you will never be with proserpina so that you have been wronged by Jupiter, and now you are doing wrong onto us. Mm-hmm. I think that was the gist of it, at least. Yeah, I think that's about it. It's a str- and then he's the god of the underworld. All of a sudden, has cognitive dissonance when you start <laughs> when you corner him like this, and it is just yeah. so funny. Yeah, it's hilarious. You're, you're like, yeah. So if you like, if you feel slighted by Jupiter and you wish that he treated you differently, then why are you treating the humans basically the same way that Jupiter was treating you? Why wouldn't you do, why wouldn't you treat them the way that you want to be treated? Yeah. And he's just like, uh. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then he lets you go. And uh, it's 
kind of great. And then you meet, and then you meet Charon on the river, and sorry, she I, back to the mortal realm. I gotta make zero. He has like these glowing blue eyes. So all of a sudden, you see the windows blue screen behind them. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> right. Um. Okay, but like one last thing I want to talk about, as far as just sort of the story is. I just loved I just loved meeting everyone in the real world in modern era, like at the museum mm -hmm. and like Galerius and and Centilla are together, you know. No, Equitea and Galerius. Oh, sorry. Equi uh, yeah, you're right. It's Equitea. I, I was thinking of God, they have so many names in there. Uh, I, Ulpius. Ulpius and Centilla are together. Ulpius and Centilla are the ones that get together. Yes. Mm -hmm. and Aurelia the bar owner was the funniest thing because she wasn't there but someone tells you that she wanted to find a prince and so and the great thing was is that she got messaged by one through an email and now she's going to Nigeria to become <laughs> a princess and I was <laughs> like yes dude she got fucking scammed <laughs> yeah incredible not the only that but all get scammed I know. Yeah. Well, it's how she would expect to be treated. So the other really good one was the gladiator apparently went into the UFC, got kicked out and then started an underground blood sport ring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Just fucking dies. There was, a, there was some really like sweet ones where like Livia, the one that like was the only one privy to the underworld uh, situation was like recovering with a friend. I can't remember who it was exactly. Oh, uh, um, I think it was was it, it wasn't Navia, was it? No, not Navia. No, no Navia. Uh, Lucretia? I don't think. Uh, might have been Lucretia. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. No. Like, it's just everyone's like you know going to school or traveling. Kabash is just gonna. Kabash is gonna go around just traveling the world. Yeah. I'm happy for Kabash. He seemed to be having a rough time of it. You're leaving out one of the best ones, which is Decius and his investment oh, portfolio. Yes. Right. Decius, that fucker. I'm so glad that he he became like a yeah. You basically tell him some bad investment advice, right? Yeah. You say like, yeah. oh, it's like get let me know what's a good pick for the stock market. And you're like, oh, Blockbuster is doing really well. <laughs> it's like, I'll put all my yeah. money in that. Invest in Blockbuster. Invest in DVDs. I think they're going to really explode. Yeah. Newsprint, I think, is uh, going to make a big comeback. <laughs> Huge comeback. Oh, yeah. Any day oh, now. One of the best details, too, is he's like like laying on one of the exhibits, like the Roman yeah. couch. He's like gone through the velvet like guard and he's just lying down when you talk to him. It's like, you yeah. piece of fucking shit. He is like gives you so much bullshit in the game. I know and a little, little bastard yeah and then it is great meeting uh proserpina at mm -hmm. the end and then as well as you know you find out that you actually saved everyone that had ever been turned to gold mm -hmm. i don't know what that means for their psyche but interesting mm -hmm. it's interesting i think you can actually control how many people get saved in the end because it, uh it's based on whether or not what, what's that guy you first meet the farmer guy it depends on whether or not you tasked him with yes with all it, the stuff it, it does because when i went for the you're I right you're right i forgot that yes i did i did save everyone mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah except for sentius actually except for sentius who gets yep. uh, he's the only gold statue left well also yeah. I didn't put this together quite, but he got his wish. He's immortal now in the Forgotten City. Yep. He's still there. A little, little bit of a genie's leprechaun's and wish granted, but, you know, it and works. he's doing his favorite thing, which is just standing in one place, not doing anything. With this <laughs> <life>. <laughs> yes, dude. Exactly what he wanted. So he, he got the good ending, too. It's what he always wanted. It's what he always wanted, you know? Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's yes, statue dude. life. Um. Oh, also, what happens to Maliolus in the end? I forget what happens. Maliolus, to I I wrote it down. Give me a sec. Oh, dude, I'm so glad you brought up Maliolus. I forgot this. I'm glad I checked my notes. Maliolus was brought back, and he was committed to a psychiatric hospital because he was claiming <laughs> yeah. to be the last rightful ruler <laughs> of the Roman Empire. Yes, wow. I, I remember that now. Actually, another one that I just remembered looking at my notes. And again, this is, I don't know if this is true or not, but Virgil, our uh, 
gay friend in the game. Mm-hmm. Him and his harasser, him and his harasser are apparently living together. Now, I don't know what that means exactly for Rufius, mm-hmm. but I like to think that Rufius was projecting some... Oh, it's explicit. Like, you find an actual, like, phallic icon in his um, quarters. Oh, if yeah, you, that's if right. You go into I totally his apartment. forgot about that. No, I, I did find that. You're right. Okay, so Rufius is... Def was definitely like in the closet, like yep. gay. Okay, great. I'm so glad he found happiness with Virgil. I'm so glad he found Virgil then. Yeah. Good for them. Good for them. Yeah, the other yeah. cute couple got their um vineyard, which was very nice. Mm-hmm. And Dooley gets uh, his gets to live with um Ecotea oh yeah, and Galerius. Oh, actually, one really quick thing. The fu- the funniest thing with Dooley is as soon as you let him go, everybody leaves. And nobody's watching him, and I'm watching him. He just the first thing he does is like something's just sitting there. I could just take it, and he just yeah, grabs I know. I watched it. it too. I know it's like you're like you guys let him go, and then immediately he <laughs> breaks the golden rule. Yeah, yeah, right away. And it was literally exactly what Sentius was worried about. It was the yeah. exact reason that he was in the cage. And I was like, oh my god, I went through so much effort to make sure Maliolus wasn't, like, didn't win the election, and that G- Gererius, or what's the other guy's name? Did? Galerius. Galerius won it, and, like, it took so long, and I was like, so, I was like, oh, what's gonna happen now? And, like, the one thing, the one thing that they all wanted to do, the one thing that seemed right, don't yeah. age this guy like an animal was what uh, killed everyone in the end. Oh well. So, something that I picked up on during the game, I don't know if others noticed it, but it definitely felt like the game was trying to make me think about moral philosophies. Uh, did you guys get that as well at all? No? No, no, no definitely no not. No, no ethical no questions way. come to mind for you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, yeah, it's a major I feel, point of the game. Yes. Now, I don't know how you guys would like to go through this, but I... Th- I feel like the main point that is brought up is morality, but not only morality, but also the concept of laws, because Sentius thinks that Roman law is the vessel for morality, but history has shown us how laws don't always reflect moral justice. Mm -hmm. It was lawful to own slaves or chop off a thief's hand. In Florida, you can't sing in a swimsuit. Do these laws really follow any universal ethics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the act of decimation is mentioned a couple times in the game to keep everyone in line. And I think we can agree that I'm not a fan of that concept. Oh, no one ever was, really. Like, if you read Roman writings, like, everyone thought this was a terrible idea for the most part. But they just wanted it, it, as it explains in the game, as this, like, weight hanging over everyone's head. It's like... If if you don't make sure that all of your peers are doing the right thing, then you could die. So it wants to put like eyes on the ground to make sure that everyone's following the laws. Like it wants everyone, everybody as a whole society to enforce that law. But, yes. Mm-hmm. But exactly. Yeah, but it, how, 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 so again, out. laws and morality, like we, we can we can see laws that don't don't match with how we feel about something morally you know it's very interesting how it is a very evolutionary thing where i think the most recent stuff going on um you know with like weed getting legalized is great you know and the thing is some people are still in jail for having sold weed illegally where it's like these people should be released what are you Mm -hmm. doing you know the reason being the reason being they broke a law that was legal at the time and the law being changed later isn't going to change the fact that they still broke a law at X point in time, even if that law doesn't make any sense. Yeah, they just grandfather their sentence in. It's like, I don't know, that that feels wrong to me. But it's interesting how people are always going to have kind of different feelings on what feels right and wrong, you know? Yeah, I so funny thing is that I heard that public discussion of the game's like moral philosophy is surprisingly not that common where a lot of the dialogue has been more about, Oh, it's a time loop game or, Oh, isn't it neat? The Skyrim mod got adapted into a real video game. 
Yeah. And I so the second playthrough, I was really focusing, taking a lot of notes on the morality. And my first playthrough, I thought it was actually, as you said, a bit intro philosophy. But I sure. th- yeah, it, yeah. It, it keeps it easy. It keeps it easily digestible. You know, you don't have to have read like all of Stoic papers and stuff mm-hmm. or really any sort of ethical papers before. I mean, really, you, hear, you hear enough yeah. Stoic quotes from Horatius to get the gist of it. Oh, uh, you I, really do. I, yeah. I really do love the Stoic quotes. I mean, listen, hey, I mean, I hear enough Stoicism from uh, from this boy Darren and uh, our other friend Ilya. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, it's a but, it's a great basis, but yeah, go on. Mm-hmm. But so I was like, oh, it's been intro philosophy. I didn't really think that much of it. But then the second time, I really focused on that. And I think the the way I would summarize the game's point of view is that it is very, it very much stands up for the idea that moral reasoning and ethical life is important, but is extremely skeptical of moral systems. And I think that's yes. best encompassed in the a conversation with "quote unquote" Philip, um, the hermit philosopher, where he, AKA Diogenes, AKA Diogenes, and that really does come through. I think in the endings where you said there's you know four or five because you neither threaten Hades or reason with them, but I think it's actually an interesting decision to make those equivalent, where in both cases you have to break the system in order to get the ending. It doesn't really matter how you're breaking it, whether or not it's outside force or the meta reason. Well, this is an interesting thing about, about changing things in, in our society. Do you break it forcefully? I think that we touched on this a little bit with um, road 96, where do you incite riots to change something? You know, Mm -hmm. do you you use violence to change something or do you use it through methodical, moral logic? Mm Hmm. Or a bit of both. Yeah, it, a bit of both. Yeah, l- yeah, little Molotov, little morals. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excellent quote. A Molotov in one hand and a pen in the other. Mm-hmm. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. I like the conversation with Philip. Uh. I was really annoyed at first because it seemed like he was basically um concluding a kind of like a moral relativism because like every time you would you try to be like well I, oh i know how, uh, um, what the correct moral philosophy is then he'd try and find some contradiction mm-hmm. which i found a, a little bit uh uh philosophy 101 kind of the way it was steering you there and but that can be interesting for some people to realize that i don't know the problem is a little harder to think through than you would originally think mm-hmm. but then yeah. he actually um, you actually make the objection uh, of like uh, uh, I, I don't remember exactly how it was brought up but basically you're like well is there no right answer though then is is nothing moral and then he basically um, says that would make sense either so he's actually mm-hmm. not concluding moral relativism but he concludes in the end he's like maybe you should just be less sure maybe it's just hard <laughs> And I was like, "Oh, I can get behind that." That's yeah, good yeah. There's, there's, there's absolutely some truth to this. This, this, this is even touched on with, um, I think, I think one of the mission, le- one of the missions in the game is called the Virtuous Man, and it's referencing Galerius because he is just a virtuous farming, like simple guy who it just mm-hmm. does good. I think it was, I think it was Miss Marvel, but it's like just in recent memory. <laughs> Is what I heard it in. It was um, good isn't something that you are; it's something you do, right? And Galerius mm-hmm. just goes around being a nice guy to people, you know. Yeah, Galerius is meant to be someone we can all agree is like a moral exemplar. Like within the context of the story, does not commit any sins really, and like no one playing the game is meant to object to his conduct in any way, really. And I think he's yeah. a good moral baseline. Yeah. He's not following any laws. Yeah, he's actually one of the few people who is probably... I mean, I think a lot of the people in the Forgotten City are, are mostly good, but all of them have a tendency to have the possibility of breaking the golden rule at mm-hmm. some point. Well, even... You can then talk about Galerius as 
even then his actions do directly lead if he gets his way to the golden rule being broken not by him and then you can also do, you know have a conversation with Dooley it's like is Dooley really responsible for his actions to me it seems like Hades being very unfair with saying that's a violation of the golden rule but at the yeah. same time Galerius's actions lead to bad consequences clearly not sinful in his own conduct but it's worth thinking about you know from a consequentialist perspective he can't act it purely out of the goodness of his own heart he could probably get duly a bigger cage though that thing was quite small <laughs> yeah i mean cool. listen listen sentius come on there's plenty of room in this place you don't have to put him in a goddamn cage like you could put also him in a house arrest yeah That'd exactly be way better Put him on a really nice house. You can a lot of houses around there. It's also interesting because technically you could say like, oh, public decoration, all property in the city is also Dooley's in addition to whoever owns it. And just he could never violate the golden rule if he takes anything. Like they could make a law that gets around the trigger in the golden rule then. Yes. And now, so I think this is the thing that we're kind of moving towards with the laws versus morality thing is that um is are we going to use the like I, laws always have this rigidity to it you know mm -hmm. as we all know there can there's perfectly reasonable laws that we can absolutely all get on board with i just nobody can really stand for murder you know i think we can all agree on that rape not good mm -hmm. um but you know if there, there's these little there's there's certain laws i should have an example on hand but i really don't and if they're not worded quite right there will be countless loopholes for criminals and lawyers to use for their own personal gain. Decius, as we all know, tries to pull some real smooth talking, some real Aes Sedai shit mm -hmm. when we try to retrieve the golden bow. Um, like, do laws need to be written in ways where there's no wiggle room or ambiguity? Because to me, the flip side of this is that now we have a system that doesn't allow exceptions to rules when the person in the wrong hasn't done anything unlawful according to the system, or at least to mo morals, at least. Mm -hmm. So is yeah. there like a way to word things where we can not have such a rigid law system? I mean, I guess there's sort of, yeah, sorry, take it away, Darren. I think that there might be a problem with ha with having laws itself I'm, I'm not saying that laws are bad but there's always going to be problems like i don't think that we really make anything that's perfect i think that uh perfection is is a human ideal an ideal we make up and it exists in our imagination well, it's not in reality. I, I love i love the quote uh i can't remember who says it but uh perfection is a direction <laughs> yeah perfection is a direction it gives you an ideal towards which you can strive it gives you a direction of improvement, really. And uh, but laws, just like anything else, are always going to have fatal flaws in their system. And I think that this game really shows how the golden rule, which a lot of people tout as one of the best basic uh, principles of most human moral systems, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and all of its other variations on that theme can be terrible because that's basically the one law of Pluto, the god, the alien of this cosmos. It seems like he's just arbitrarily chosen the golden rule and he's mm -hmm. like not really giving it very much thought. He's not even really following it himself. Well, <laughs> he he just thinks that everyone should know right and wrong inherently. He says something along those lines while you're talking to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well, this idea you, that you should everyone... know. You should know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we well, gave when? you the basic outline. You can figure it out. And if you when when do I know? When I'm five, ten, fifteen? Like what when when is the threshold of age for us to stop sinning? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's there's so many problems like that. But yeah, exactly. The thing is, is if you really if you really take if you take something like morality, which is very complicated and needs to be thought through and you need to think about situations where, there, where there's exceptions and you boil it down to just some simple rule that sounds good at first, it's going to turn into an absolute disaster. It's going to mm -hmm. be, be terrible. And I think that's what this game shows because it shows you all the ways that the golden rule, do unto others as you wish 
that they would do unto you can be exploited when maybe what you would actually want people to do you is to do to you is is would be terrible. They want to do you. Else. They want to do you. <laughs> <laughs> someone else can be could not want what you would want done to you. You know. Um. No, I think that goes into the main thesis. I think of the game, which is that moral reasoning is necessary for humans, but moral systems are inherently flawed because they're too rigid. And that's the thing about, say, a law. You need to interpret it and you need to ha- be willing to have people discuss, you know, let's say, like, let's say hypothetically, you had someone listening to the conversation you had with uh, Decius. Decius, yeah. Listen to the conversation at Decius when you agreed to split the rewards from getting the golden bow. And then he locks you in and said, oh, no, I said, if you split in half, you'd be infinite money. I didn't say I'd actually do it. Anyone listening and like to the discourse would be like, well, wait a minute. Clearly, you meant to imply that that would be the result. So morally, you need to let him out and enjoy the profits. I really well, want to take this. Yes, <laughs> I have a degree in linguistics, and so you're totally onto something here, Dylan. So with laws, okay. So there's a thing. There's a thing that's happened in any um, human discourse around laws and navigation around laws, which is there's two kinds of meaning in language. One meaning is context independent. Doesn't matter. Where you utter this word, it always means, it always has this kind of meaning. Like the word apple always has a certain kind of meaning inherent to it, no matter where you utter it. But you can use the word apple to refer to two totally different apples in different contexts. So the other kind of meaning is context-dependent meaning. Context-independent meaning is called semantics. Context-dependent meaning is called pragmatics. Well, a lot of discourse around law will only look at semantic meaning for things. And I think it's because it's very difficult to parse out what a particular context is. And so the pragmatic meaning can be very hard to pin down exactly, especially Mm -hmm. because just from the basic fact that if you're talking about something that was uttered previously, now you're in a different context. You're not submersed in that context you're not living it so you have to try and like recreate it and you can get things wrong you can miss Mm -hmm. things you can omit things that were obvious in that context so it's very it's much harder to to recreate a pragmatic all the pragmatic all the context that'll show you the actual pragmatic meaning Mm -hmm. this is exactly how mobsters tried to get out of uh being pinned for things of saying yeah take care of them yeah and so when when that person uh who, who was it with the bow who traps you when they said, yes. yeah, yeah. If, when they said that, if obviously it was in, it was uh, in that context intended to be um, interpreted a certain way, but um, he made that classic little sneaky maneuver of say, of being, of reverting to the semantic meaning and say, well, I could have possibly meant this when obviously that was not true in that context that, that he meant that. And mm-hmm. tries to sneak away with it being correct, but yeah, but I think I think it's actually not. It, that should have that should have broken the the golden rule. But for some reason, people and if anything has something to do with law, they just revert to only paying attention to semantic meaning. Unfortunately, Very Pluto annoyingly. was not a linguist, so he didn't really catch him on that distinction. Pluto should have been a linguist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I don't think he was very learned in many th- and a lot of things, it seems like. Mm-hmm. I don't even think I have to ask this next question that I put down. Is there one system for morality that is perfect? I think we can all say it together. No. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there is. It's stoicism. <laughs> Horatio should have been in charge. Yeah, I like, we all, I like that I said it. Let's say it together, and we all said something completely different. <laughs> uh, well, the Stoic system is actually just like uh, carefully built so that it's different for every person. So, my answer is yeah, basically which no. which just sounds <laughs> like moral relativism to me, but yeah, it's not. 
I know. I have well, had this discussion and it's reasons. way yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it basically looks like it. <laughs> it. It certainly sounds like it at times. But I feel like that is a, that could be a whole podcast in and of itself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So, yeah, that's good. But yeah. Yeah, any last kind of final thoughts though, boys? Wrap this up. Overall experience, how was the game for you guys? So um, I thought that the game looked decent. It looked pretty good. Um, it plays a bit janky. Uh, it has kind of some janky mechanics, but they're acceptable. They're good enough. And it's really just the whole game is just a vehicle for the narrative and exploring the narrative. At least the game isn't a point and click adventure, you know? It, it gives you enough gameplay to be more to be more engaging than just a point and click, which I often feel kind of trapped in. But it is essentially a point and click, but it's it has it just has more features than that. But I thought that the game's main point was to make you think deeply about moral considerations and reflect on how people in the past were not so different from us now. We're building on top of the past and there's a lot of the same issues that they were dealing with back then. Well said. Well said, yeah. Getting people to think about that, including myself, is great. And I really enjoyed how the game went about it. It made that whole moral, all that, all those moral quandaries, all those interests, made them engaging and made them fun to think about. Yeah, well said. I like that. Mm-hmm. Dylan? My opinion is much the same on the technical issues as well as overall really enjoying it. The main difference for me was this was my second time playing it, and I was a little bit nervous going in because I remember playing it, and it was a game that I didn't think I needed to replay again, but I was actually really happy with the replay, and I got a lot more out of it my second time than I did my first time. Mm, Just approaching it really with an open, like, focus on what the game is giving you in terms of moral philosophy as opposed to trying to take in the plot necessarily really luxuriate in what it's trying to get across more than anything cool yeah i think i i I think i share the same sentiments as you guys i think any form of storytelling that gets you to think even if it's just a little if it's new even just new concepts to you is a always a good experience yeah but yeah yeah I think, uh, yeah, we've definitely we've definitely reached the end of the podcast. I think we can say, mm-hmm. and, yeah, it uh, has been a podcast. It has it has been a podcast. Yeah, if for some weird reason you're listening to this and you somehow haven't heard of the Good Place, um, that's another very digestible moral uh, story that is a good time. So it, it was just something that crossed my mind, you know. But anyway, yeah, um, we have reached the end of the podcast. And I hope you had a good time. And if you want to join us for the next podcast, without spoilers, the next game we will be playing is Metroid Dread, starring Dylan's favorite Smash character, Samus Aran. She's back at her usual adventures of scurrying through labyrinthine passages and collecting missile upgrades, all while surviving the latest threat of murderous robots called Emmys. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to the game. It's exclusive to the Nintendo Switch, obviously, if you've never heard of Metroid. Um, read a book. No. <laughs> <laughs> a Nintendo book. Mm-hmm. Re- please read a Nintendo manual. Um, read, read Nintendo Power. <laughs> yeah, sadly, sadly, Darren will not be joining us, but uh, our favorite Levi will be back, and he will be hosting instead of my sorry ass. So I'm sure we'll all be looking forward to that. Thanks for stopping by and stay classy. Bye. Goodbye, everyone.